Hello, everyone. Hello. Thank you guys for coming. Um, today we've got a very special guest. Uh, Carolina is the co-founder co and director of programs at Charity Entrepreneurship. There she ensures the delivery of key programs across multiple departments. Uh, she also trains and mentors uh, the incubator program participants to start uh, high impact charities. Carolina also serves as a fund manager at Effective Altruism um, and advises um, for various EA nonprofits and think tanks such as uh, Fish Welfare Initiative, uh, Magnify Mentor Mentoring and Legal Priority Projects. Before starting Charity Entrepreneurship, she co-founded the Polish, Polish Foundation for Effective Altruism, uh, which worked to increase the effectiveness of NGOs. And during her master's studies, she became the youngest university lecturer in her country. Uh, please join me in welcoming Carolina. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Um, all right. So today we'll be talking about what happens if you decide to start a charity. Uh, starting a new charity or a new project, tackling some of the most pressing problems could be you know, in, in parallel and in, in, in impact. In fact, if you're well suited to this career, it very, much, very well might be like the highest impact thing one can do. Um, I won't be getting much into why this time. Uh, for that, if you want to learn more, you can check out 8,000 hours career profile on that or uh, C's website where we speak a, a little bit more about that. Um, but this time I want to talk about um, what are some advantages and disadvantages of running and starting your own organization? What are some key personal fit characteristics that you, um, you need um, to, in order to start effective projects? And also, what are some lessons learned from you know, incubating those charities in the past that anyone could pick up for a new project, regardless if they'll be starting it through the incubation program or they want to start it autonomously? And so for now, just imagine what would happen if, for example, Rob haven't started, started Against Mother Foundation, or if Will and Toby haven't, hasn't started Giving What We Can, or Center for Effective Altruism. Um, so starting stuff uh, that succeeds could be really, really impactful. Um, so, but it's really hard to tell um, if your project is going to be success and what are some predictive factors from early, early stages. And even if you're in the midst of it, you still might not be entirely sure like if you're going the right direction and what the impact is going to be, especially for some of the long-term goals. Um, what doesn't help is the fact that when you, you only hear about charities where they already get pretty big. So like the bigger the charity, the more likely you are to, to know about it. So, you know, against Snyder Foundation, the Humane League or 80,000 Hours, the bigger the charity, the more likely it is that you'll hear about it. Um, and at that point, we only see the final product, talented, coordinated team, high impact intervention, and well set up operations. In short, smoothly sailing ship. And no wonder that if you look at yourself and your idea for charity, you might just feel like a child with leaf and, bo uh, leaf and stick boat. At least that's how I at the beginning felt of it when, when we were putting charity entrepreneurship together. It's just really hard to imagine that you'll get anywhere with it. And in the process of becoming effective charity, uh, turning this little raft into like full big ship is like a little bit mysterious and there's no instructions on how to do it. Um, at least they weren't until we decided to start charity entrepreneurship, where on a daily basis, my team and I support those charities, helping them find direction, find the crew, build the ship, and so they can sail toward the direction of you know, higher impact charity. Um, so again, in this talk, I'll be talking about using some examples, some experience from early days, early months, and early years of starting a nonprofit. Oh, Isaac, could you speak a little bit, please? Yes, I will. I, I will. Um, and the reason I want to take you for, is it better? Yeah. Great. And the reason I want to take you for this journey is, first of all, to give you a better sense whether charity entrepreneurship or nonprofit entrepreneurship more broadly is a good path for you, and also to help you um, learn the lessons from those incubating those 18 EA aligned nonprofits over the last three years uh, that you could take for your own projects going forward. Uh, but for those that haven't heard about CE before, just very briefly an introduction, uh, how we work. So first we conduct basically, we conduct research in a variety of cause areas, spending th uh, thousands of hours on, on researching what interventions to recommend in a given cause area, taking into account like the impact of the intervention, the size of the problem, but also like, is there a gap for new nonprofit in this space and so on and so forth. After we kind of uh, select, uh, select those ch top charities within each cause area, we uh, seek co-founders for it and help them train them and pair them with each other and with the intervention during two months incubation program. 
after which those that you know, pair together successfully um, and develop a good plan receive a C grant uh, mentorship and are ready to basically start, start their own projects, after which we provide long-term support as well. Um, so yes, so today I'll learn about some of the mysteries. Um, I'll talk about what happens if you decide to start a char charity. Um, of course, the progress might look very different depending on the charity, and the road is often more complicated than that, uh, but I want to bring you closer the experience the, of running your own project. Um, I'll do it on an example of three charities, uh, Let Exposure Elimination Project, Fush Welfare Initiative, and Fortify Health. Uh, I'll tell you what happens in the first days, first months, and first years, and what are some disadvantages, advantages, personal fits, and lessons taken from that. So I'll start with LEAP. Um, our research team identified that lead poisoning is a pressing and under resourced pro problem. About almost a million children have toxic blood lead levels that leads to almost a million deaths, uh, imposing also a social cost in order of like five to ten trillion dollars annually. Most of that comes from neurological damages um, and losses in IQ, causing income later, uh, losses in income later in life. Um, and still, there was like 111 countries that still allowed uh, lead to be in paint used in painting, for example, someone's houses or schools or other public places, basically slowly uh, poisoning uh, uh, countries on population level. Um, at the same time, there was about $11 million going into the problem at the time. So really tiny amount compared to the uh, global burden of, this, of this disease. Uh, so in 2022, we, uh, we created Jack and Lucia to start the Lead Exposure Elimination Project. In their first months, uh, nine months since incubation, they managed to secure commitment with the government in Malawi to withdraw the usage of lead paints put in, and put in place suitable enforcement mechanisms. Uh, so that already kind of, that's just one thing, led up to about uh, 200 children not getting lead poison, prevent, uh, not getting lead poisoning in, in those kind of initial years of preventing the exposure. And now they have been going campaigns in nine countries to help government bat, uh, ban lead paint and force them. Um, and their aim is bigger than that. So something that you'll see immediately in your first days or even maybe even earlier than that, than that is that the enormous potential for impact. And I think that's the biggest advantage of the job. Uh, this has been true historically, but even more now with increasing funding in earmarked for EA aligned NGOs and simultaneously troubles in finding existing organization that could deploy it at the same level or higher level of effectiveness than previously identified top charities. And that's why career, uh, career profile on fun, uh, of founders of for new projects by 8,000 hours says that if you're well suited to this career, it might be the very best way for you to have social impact. And, and I couldn't, couldn't agree with more of that. Um, but also in the first days, you'll notice that your work balance might be a little bit different. And that's some of this is a disadvantage that you'll notice early on. Uh, the first days as a charity entrepreneur might not be the best time to start, you know, very time consuming hobby or plan extended holiday your work-life balance is likely to suffer at the very, very beginning. That might change in the future, but at the beginning, I'm sure you'll be, feel very dedicated and would like to put all, all that you have in order to get the project off the ground. Um, and as an entrepreneur, the distinction between life and work could become a little bit less clear just because how dedicated you might become to, to the project. Um, and to use example of, of Leap, um, they have three full-time staff. Uh, including two co-founders. That's not really big team for working across nine countries. Um, and in each of this, this country, they run pain studies, they meet with stakeholders and decision makers to help them put in place new regulation enforcement mechanisms, as well or, as well with or work with companies to uh, transition away, away from leaded paint. Um, you know, the first country visit was quite intense, definitely outside of nine to five work hours, just because you really want to make the most out of it, the short kind of visit that you have. Um, of course, as your organization grows, um, delegation posts will also become more established and you'll not have to constantly, you know, extinguish fires on top of your regular leadership duties. Um, staff will take your operations and you'll be able to focus on strategic decisions. Uh, all of this will reduce your workload and stress levels. Leap is also expanding in terms of staff. They're applying very big hiring ground this year. Uh, so this will change, but at the beginning, you'll likely have to put a little bit more into that than you might expect from a regular job. And that's some advantage to keep in mind. Um, so what about personal fit? Uh, well, I think that relates well to, to the most part, the most important uh, personal fit characteristic, which is being ambitiously altruistic. I know that entrepreneurs love ambition and it's a very common thing, but it's very easy to be ambitious about the wrong thing. 
So for example, if you're ambitious about how big your charity is, your charity might get really, really big, but it won't necessarily do any good. Uh, so you have to be very careful to make sure that the metric, that you're laser focused on the metric that actually matters. So either if it's life saved or whatever other metric you take as your end line of success, be being focused on that is going to be more important instead of necessarily only looking for like some uh, proxy source heuristic, like for example, the size of organization or number of operations and things like that. Um, so one of the lessons learned from Leap is that cost effectiveness of your work could look very, very promising, even in a small country. Um, so Malawi has like 19.5 million people. Uh, so it's quite a small country. Um, and yet when uh, there were some estimates made on their impact of banning leaded paint in Malawi, it came out to be about $12 per DALI averted or roughly $360 per life saved. This is just for comparison. This is comparable to or exceeding comparable charities evaluated by GiveWell, top char GiveWell char charities. So it'll be very easy to at that point say like, my work is done um, and leave all the potential impact on the table. But with such scale of global problems, even if you achieve really high level of cost effectiveness and success early on, you st need to basically still you know, be ambitious. You know, there are about 111 countries that still don't have pain, lead paint regulation. So even if you reach that impact early on, you have to think about like the total scale of the problem. And instead of like cupping yourself at the beginning of that, trying to tap in into the broader, broader impact that is awaiting you to some extent. Um, so a couple of lessons from, from them. Uh, the speed of progress with government has been, hasn't been a limiting factor. As I mentioned, nine months to pass regulation in one country. This is way shorter than we expected. When we were modeling initially cost effectiveness, we expected it to, to take a couple of years. So that was a good lesson learned. Um, there are some surprising low-hanging fruits. People are keen to change some policies and uh, people are, uh, you, you will be able to get some people on board with that and potentially achieve some success early on. Um, and also cost effectiveness can look very promising in the, even in a small country, but uh, all in all, you could achieve large impact early on, but keep being ambitious, not to leave the impact on the table. That's kind of the more, most important lesson I think we take from, from Leap example. Um, okay, so you survive your first days, you know you can have impact and need to be ambitious, great. Uh, what's awaiting you in your first months? And um, I'll tell about that an example of Fish Welfare Initiative. Just as a background, uh, fish is one of the most numerously farmed species. Uh, on top of their scale of the, scale of the production, um, there's also welfare concerns, like numerous of them, like poor water quality, a special dissolved oxygen, or high stocking densities, high disease and mortality rates, behavioral restrictions, all sorts, of, so a lot, all lots of things like that. Um, and yet, when we researched that in 2018, there was no organization focusing singly on uh, addressing this problem. On top of that, uh, majority of fish were in the countries where foreground far work on farm animals organization was almost non-existent. And farming practices and leverage points that were working in, for example, US or Europe, weren't necessarily working in India, uh, where uh, organizations or, or India or Philippines or Indonesia or organizations like that could, could have the highest impact. Um, so in 2018, we, uh, in the first ever incubation program, Tom and Haven decided to start Fish Welfare Initiative. They mainly work in India, as I mentioned, but also do starting to set up some groundwork in Philippines and China. And since then, you know, FWI had made significant progress, secured first ever corporate commitment for fish, uh, built a effectively working team, um, directly impacted already hundreds of thousands of fish and over a million of, um, and improved lives of over a million shrimps, um, and so on and so forth. And only two years after inception, giving what we can, also listed FWI as top donation recommendation. And the most importantly of all, in those three couple of years, they learned a lot about and help uh, right now are helping others how to get faster to the same spot that they are right there right now. So in the first month, you already start building skills. This refers to both the abilities from, you know, that you acquire from a working a job that could be cross applicable to other careers, particularly careers focused on having an impact. So if credentials are the tools to get you the job, the skills are actually the things that will help you to be very good at that job. And because the job is challenging and it has a variety of tasks, um, you have to learn a lot every day. Um, so for example, take FWI. When they were starting up, they didn't have that much knowledge. Both Tom and Haven were jumping to entrepreneurship straight from their undergrad, uh, undergrad degree. Tom in philosophy, Haven in computer science. Not really a background that you expect for people running a fish welfare charity. Um, but what was really great is that they were keen to learn and they learned quickly. 
Uh, so even though they didn't have any formal background, they were able to catch up and right now are learning this great organization. Um, so in the first two months, they, um, you'll learn tons about actual subject matter and about management. Um, this knowledge is highly relevant to help uh, one of the most neglected species, but also is very transferable to other careers that are really important. So when I asked Tom and Haven what were some of the key things they learned in the first years, they said things like how to build a system, uh, systematic decision-making process, about, or how to not spend way too long on every project and keep yourself accountable, or how to receive feedback and how to know which feedback to ignore, because that's also a very important skill. Um, all of that very important and, and, and transferable. Uh, so all of this was necessary because the work uh, and the environment they, they worked in was very, very complex. And this is a little bit of an advantage, uh, disadvantage of, of working in kind of, um, when, when you're working on pioneering a work in new field. There's just not really made, made, made solutions. Um, and not all of that you can learn from just desktop research or previous preparation. Um, so one of the lessons learned from FWI is understanding that there is a very big difference between what is theoretically most important, what is practically most important, and what is actually feasible. Um, I'll give an example in a second. Uh, but what desktop research showed to be most important for fish welfare and what is the most effective way to achieve that won't necessarily correspond to the real problem, for example, when they visit a fish farm. Um, the root of the problem might lead somewhere else. On, on top of that, maybe it's just, just not the most feasible option because there are multiple limitations of that. So there's a limitation of desktop research. And one of the first lessons is to, uh, when you're starting a new project, is like try to get on the ground as soon as possible to uh, challenge your assumptions and to test your assumptions. So instead of when you're nav navigating your ship, instead of, for example, thinking about it as going from problem to the solution, like for example, fish have low dissolved oxygen level in water, well, I'll go to the farm and give farmers aerators to give more oxygen. Problem solved, you might think. But the reality, of course, is much more complex. And the process of that looks more like that, where you basically have to you know, work from um, a problem, then assume uh, or state some hypothesis about that, test it, and then very likely you'll have to come back. Well, to come back to the problem because maybe you even conceptualize the problem in the wrong way. And then you realize that when being on the field and then you have to say new hypothesis and test it again. And if you're, if you're doing it well and you, know, you have strong feedback loops, uh, eventually you would hit something that you'll be able to execute and you'll start executing, it'll be going great. And there the situation will change because you solve maybe the original problem or there was a new complexity that came up uh, that was unexpected. So after execution, you'll have to come back to the problem to hypothesis and testing again. And that's kind of, you'll be going more of those cycles instead of just like a straight line like that. Um, so in they, their case, reality was much complex than that. For example, farmers had non-standardized uh, non practices and low level of training and very few resources. So it wasn't just, you know, some of them had aerators, but for example, there were frequent ele electricity shortages. And that's just not something that you could do something about because very often they were during monsoon seasons and therefore the level of dissolved oxygen fluctuated and it's not going to be solved by just giving some area to certain people but it might work for other farmers so you basically have to like tailor it very well and and at the same time you have to think about this uh your intervention being very scalable so there's some trade about how to tailor it and how to make sure that it's scalable um so that's kind of first complexity other things were like production was dispersed across many individuals. It wasn't like a centralized farming practices. Uh, farmers were not affected by common leverage points. Um, and many improvements risk pushing industry to, toward intensification because if, for example, you improve water quality, but don't keep stocking this DLO, farmers can just like farm more fish uh, per each farm. So you have to balance that as well. So it is really, really complex. Um, and people sometimes are arguments getting started at like defining the problem. Um, that's why, you know, the most important trait for entrepreneur is uh, having good judgment and kind of being ready to continuously learn. Um, so three lessons from them. Uh, you don't need specialized background if you're uh, able and keen to learn fast. Uh, figuring, figuring out things as you go is not necessarily a sign of poor preparation or incompetence. It's a vital part of entrepreneurial journey, journey. And it's important to remember that when you start your own project, even in more evidence-based space or proven spaces, be ready that uh, you'll have to keep learning um, due to complexity and uncertainty on the environment and just like changing conditions. So having good judgment and continuous learning is going to be your friend along the journey. Um, 
Okay, so what about first couple of years? Um, to reflect on that, we'll look at Fortify Health, organization incubated by us in 2017, before charity entrepreneurship was an organization it is now, before charity entrepreneurship was organization at all. Uh, we met Brenda and Nikita uh, before CWC was a thing. We previously uh, conducted research and started Charity Science Health, the direct, direct global health organization. But through preparation to launch, the team researched other interventions that could be really, really outstanding and they were missing in the space. And that was iron and folic acid fortification. Um, at the time, the idea was that we'll start organizations in series. Maybe we'll go and start uh, SMX vaccine reminder charity, Charity Science Health. And we'll establish it, work on it a couple of years. Once it's running, we, we hire a replacement and then we go on and start another charity. For example, folic and acid fortification charity. And that was kind of the plan. But then we met Brendan and Nikita. And they were like, okay, we want to give it a shot. We want to give it a try and start our organization as well. So we thought about the impact that it could have, that if instead of waiting a couple of years for us to step down and start a new charity, what if they can do it right now? Of course, we will speed up the progress by it by at least a couple of years. So we said, okay, let's do that. Uh, provided them very small CCD at the time, 20K, and, and gave them a bunch of advice and Nikita and Brandon co-founded for Dubai Health. I can tell you now that in the latest update, GiveWell estimated that Fortify Health has 25% chance of becoming GiveWell top charity. And there was a while ago, and I can only tell right now that the odds increased a little bit since then. Um, so they, they experienced sparked the idea. What if we can start multiple charities in each year? Instead of like starting a couple of um, one charity every couple of years, we start a couple of charities each year. Um, and that's how charity entrepreneurship came to be. So the indirect impact that Fortify Health was inspiring uh, to start charity entrepreneurship. And that's the biggest, uh, one of another big advantage is the indirect impact you can have, both on your personal life in terms of building career capital, transferable skills, credentials, background, knowledge, all of that, but also um, have the effects that it has on the whole charity sector. So for example, if your charity is really, really good, it can raise the standards in the field and like make it more competitive and therefore improve the effectiveness of organizations that now have strong incentives to uh, be better or spread or stabilize some key concept. Like for example, you should measure impact or you should be establishing good monitoring and evaluation system that takes into account long and short-term effects. Um, it can also build uh, EA or effective charity movements, encourage allocation of resources, the previously neglected areas. And there's just like hungry effects like that. Um, and from my perspective, of course, you know, the, the biggest indirect impact at Fortify Health was, was kind of basically leading to starting charity, charity entrepreneurship. Um, so what about disadvantages? Uh, well, that's when uncertainty comes again. Uh, there's no straight path, um, certain path you can follow when you're running your, uh, your charity. Um, even successful servers involve lots of uncertainty. So when Fortify Health was starting, uh, they wanted to, of course, gain lots of knowledge at the beginning of that. So um, they started interviewing experts. And when they told experts that they were planning to fortify flour with iron and folic acid, some experts basically disagreed, saying like, you know, this fortification thing is great, but you should be fortifying rice. This is like the cool things now. This is what the governments are interested in. You'll be able to like get bigger and scale so much faster if you do it, do it with, with rice. And they really considered that, uh, but they cracked the numbers, run custom analysis and determined just even if they will be uh, able to marginally faster scale, the custom links will be so much smaller. So they stick with flour. And I think that's retrospectively, it was a good choice because maybe if they went with rice, they will be able to scale faster, but because of the cost magnitude will be so much lower and, and therefore the effect will be smaller in total as well. And scale wasn't really a factor, uh, a concern for them. They might have not been, you know, give well uh, incubated um, or might not be in the space where they are right now. Um, so when you're running a charity, you'll be facing many choices and you won't have, you know, obviously good answer to that. Um, and each of them, unfortunately, could lead to either your success or your failure. For example, you might run a RCT, and after a couple of years, the result will come back showing no effect. There's not much you can do about that. Um, so there is some inherent uncertainty built into the model. But I think if you stay, you know, focused on impact and you have lots of support, uh, you know, mentors and advisors and um, and all of those and, and all contact with other entrepreneurs that are going for a similar journey that might just uh, make it so much easier for you and reduce the, the uncertainty a little bit. Um, so that's related to important personal fit characteristic, uh, doing it for the right reason. There are many reasons to start a charity. None of them are, uh, not all of them are altruistic. Some of them is to, you know, 
impress others or you know feel motivated or feel good about themselves yourself or, or things like that and sometimes kind of those kind of inter motivations can interfere with the ultimate female goal of you know causing most, a lot of impact um, and people uh, and that will have that will have consequences on the outcomes of your organization so rice would have been much easier to get to scale very fast uh, they might you know um, it might uh, get to scale very fast, maybe they might look very good, maybe the government will support them, but ultimately on the long, in the long run, if the effectiveness of the intervention wasn't, wasn't, wasn't that high, that wouldn't be an impactful route for them. So it's really important to kind of remember that some things are just proxies and other and sometimes it could be good heuristics for what take, what makes impact for organization, for example, how much uh, dollars they can absorb and effectively spend, but remember that those are just proxies and ultimately we should be focusing on kind of the impactful and like metric of your organization. Okay, so what about the kind of like overall trajectory and success, average success rate? Um, so across the three years, when we look at the charities, about two out of five, which is five charities about what we started per year, two out of five charities each year um, are estimated to exceed cost effectiveness of the strongest charities in their field and have been supported by multiple independent funding bodies um, like Open Philanthropy Project, GiveWell or EA Funds. About two of them, uh, two out of five, make progress but remain small scale or have very uncertain cost effectiveness, and one of five shut down in their first 25 months without having significant impact. And that's what we encourage too. Um, it's very important um, to, if you are not making progress, especially if you're not making progress because, for example, intervention is not longer relevant or there has been significant things that have changed in space and that made the organization not, not effective, it's also important to shut down quickly and maybe move on to another organization. Just because sometimes the biggest cost of starting a new nonprofit is not necessarily going to be the funding, it's going to be your time. So if you can uh, step down and spend your time more effectively somewhere else, uh, that's going to be very important. So for example, when we are modeling cost effectiveness of charities we incubated, we take into account co-founders' uh, counterfactuals. So what the co-founder would spend their time on if not for finding that charity. And we discount the cost effectiveness by, by that counterfactual um, impact of their time. Um, so yeah, that's why that's why it's important to also kind of keep evaluating organization and shut down if it's not going well and try something else uh, or pivot. All right, so have, there you have it. Uh, early days, early months, and every uh, early years. Uh, just to reiterate some of the lessons, cost of business could be very large early on, but you need to be keep being ambitious to not leave the impact on the table. In complex and poor information environment, figuring as you go is not necessarily a sign of poor prep or incompetence. It's a vital part of entrepreneurship journey. And incentives aren't always set up right. And you need to pursue nonprofit entrepreneurship for the right reason and be laser focused on it. Otherwise, you might wake up with you know, being, running big organ prestigious organizations, but not actually have much impact. Uh, there's much more lesson learned from that. In fact, there's 500 pages of lessons. Uh, we've written a short book about that. Um, it's available on Amazon if you're interested, or you can, if you're a group organizer, you can order it through EA Books Direct. Uh, it's just full of you know, real life examples and some of the lessons about starting and running uh, your own nonprofit. So incubation program participants uh, are from all over the world and they represent a wide variety of charities. Um, some of them, some of those people never expected that they will one day run high impact charity, charity in the future. Um, but imagine that if you're, that organization that you started, for example, improved how development aid is allocated, improving effectiveness of billions of dollars in spending, or discovered a new cause area, uh, so-called cause X, that is going to be picked up in, in EA and lots of people end up working on that as one of the top, uh, top causes or successfully advocated to increase excess tobacco taxes, leading to preventing hundreds of thousands of deaths and over a hundred millions in economic costs. Those are some of the organizations that we would like to um, start this year. So if that's something, if that sounds like something like you would like to do, uh, let me know. We are looking uh, for people to, who are keen to start those charities in this upcoming summer program. Um, if you're still wondering if you're a good fit, I recommend taking a very quick quiz on our website. We basically design it to make it, it takes like 10 minutes or less, uh, and we design it to help you make decisions about if, if the entrepreneurship is good pathway for you. Um, you can also apply. We designed the process uh, for, for you to be informative as well. So even if you're not 100% sure, you can still apply and through doing the test task and interviews, you can test your fit. You can also ask questions to the CE team and, and, and we'll help you decide if that's a pathway for you. Uh, we extended the deadline by one week, specifically for people at the EAG X conference. Uh, so you can apply till April the 3rd. Um, and just, and just some maybe word of en encouragement a little bit. Um, we surveyed people that took part in incubation program and 
50% of them of the most successful founders from previous years didn't even think they should apply. So don't, don't doubt your potential. Um, second fact was that nobody came to the program qualified to start a charity. Uh, that's just something what the course is built for. Uh, so we'll train you in all the necessary skills you need in order to start and run the organization. Um, base traits are more important than your background necessarily. So having you know, great intelligence, resourcefulness, and being focused on outcomes is something that will make a real difference. Um, and for a lot of people, starting highest impact time, uh, the highest impact time to start a charity is right now, just because you could be running really impactful organization for a couple of years, um, and you learn those things along the lines, or you could delay that and start five, five, five years later, and maybe you'll be have more marginally more skills, but I am like 80% sure that most of the relevant skills and needed skills, you'll be able to learn so much faster by doing the job, as for example, from FWL experience. Um, so sometimes starting earlier and learning along the way will be better than like delaying and trying to build career capital and starting later. Um, all right, you can also reach out to me personally. I'm always happy to chat with people. Uh, so this is my email. Feel free to, or connect me with me on, on the app or over email, and I'll be happy to chat with those that are interested. And if you have also um, you know, other suggestions for, it, for us, that would be really, really great. Um, so thanks so much for today, and I uh, look forward to your questions. Yes, definitely. So a uh, lot of the charities started through our incubation program are hiring and they're growing fast. So there's basically at any point, moment in time, there'll be some organizations with open roles uh, that people can apply for and, and join the incubation program. One thing that we do throughout our application program as well, if someone apply for the incubation program, and for example, they might not be the best time for them. They have really good potential, but maybe it's a little bit too early for them. We also let them know about that. And then we can we refer those candidates to existing organizations that we think are will be best fit for them specifically to train up in their skills. So maybe, for example, if they need some a little bit more, um, I know they want to test how comfortable they will be in like living, for example, in low or middle income country, maybe we we'll recommend them to work with Fish Welfare Initiative that works in India. Or maybe if we think that they could learn some management, maybe we will uh, recommend an organization that is like uh, looking for uh, people helping, helping with them managing the team or operations. So we kind of tailor that as well. Um, but if not, on our website, we in, in charity entrepreneurship, in our job um, kind of section, we also list jobs open uh, right now in the organization we started. So that's also an option. Uh, a couple of other hands up questions, so we can go to live discussion. Cool, I'll ask, I'll ask a couple of questions that come through. Um, is entrepreneurial drive uh, attraction to being a founder slash starter for its own sake, uh, part of personal fit? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that drive is something that you will likely develop and something to some extent that, that you need in order to do that. However, you don't necessarily have it from the very beginning. Uh, you might be, for example, when I was starting out, I was like very, very, very excited about uh, improving like big NGOs and big foundations. And, you know, I, I had a kind of thought that even if I improve effectiveness of like very large foundation, even by, by just 10%, uh, because of the scale of their operations, the impact will be really, really large. And that's something I was very, very motivated in. Um, and then Joey and I had like, like really long debates, like months long debates, whether it's better to like improve existing organization or start new ones. And well, he won the debate. And so I moved to Canada and we started charity entrepreneurship. And over time, I got really just very, very excited and driven about early stage nonprofits and helping them you know, start and grow and everything. So drive, I think it's something that you can also develop. You don't have to come with it at the beginning, especially drive for a specific charity. You just uh, you, you will just lo learn to love your, the, the thing that you do. Uh, so I do think drive is something that is helpful for sure. Um, it also has some disadvantages, you know, work-life balance, you have to manage it well, things like that. Uh, but I think you don't have to have it from the start. Cool. So we've got an interesting question. What's the difference between a charity entrepreneur and a social ent enterprise entrepreneur? Yeah, so the kind of the fundamental things, difference we see is that 
charity entrepreneur maximizes just one outcome, like number of life, uh, life saved or uh, things, basically just um, metrics focus on the impact of organization, where a social enterprise has to maximize for both the impact, but also for the profit uh, in order to help them grow. So because of that single difference in model, uh, of course, you, you might be uh, able to like make smaller progress uh, if you're maximizing for a couple of outcomes instead of just single hand uh, focusing on one of those. So that's kind of fundamental difference in the design of those things um, that will lead to further consequences. So for example, you might be able to reach scale faster with a social enterprise, but your marginal impact might be a little bit smaller versus if you, for example, start with uh, you focus on charity entrepreneurship itself. Uh, that might also be different according to cost areas. So cost, some cost areas have more funding available for early stage nonprofits. That's certainly true for, for example, farm annual welfare where if you're doing impactful work, uh, you might you will get funding for that support for, for that work as well. So it's not necessarily going to be you know a stopping point for your scale. Uh, so I think there are just some differences that so comes from that very basic differentiations. But my sense is that because by the fact that you have to maximize for two outcomes, you often will have to uh, sacrifice in one of those. And very often, or even if not, and the impact of that is going to suffer for that. That's why kind of we decided to uh, specifically focus on nonprofit entrepreneurship, especially uh, if funding is not a constraint for the charities. Interesting question now. Um, if you do not get into the bootcamp, are you still encouraged to work on a CEA curated topic, or are you then uh, mostly competing with bootcamp participants? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think like competition in the charity space is a good thing. Uh, just because if there's more people to some extent working on the problem, then there are like better incentives for others to get uh, to be better at it. There's also sometimes a luck factor that comes to entrepreneurship, just something that is outside of your control that will make some charities impactful and not others. Um, it could be like something that you cannot predict. So in a way, uh, that's why kind of starting more nonprofits is also like just on aggregate maximize the chance that some of them will hit really high impact. Um, with this case specifically, there's also, of course, cons to that. So if, for example, the space is low in funding, you might indirectly comp compete for something like that or for talent or for funding, and that, that might hinder your progress. Um, I think that will depend on the case-by-case -case basis. I would probably more recommend people to ask for feedback, uh, get basically uh, get a little bit more um, trained up or experienced in that area and then reapply and start that nonprofit again, uh, try to start a nonprofit. Uh, unless you feel that, you know, you have already uh, or you might not have the ability in the future, then you can just chat to us personally. You can say that, oh, you know, I'm still interested in starting that. Uh, maybe we can then discuss it one on one and see what's best for your your uh, for you specifically. Cool. So we got a question. Um, do charity entrepreneurship do any long termist? projects, um, or is it mostly just animal welfare and international health? Yeah. So historically, we focus mostly on farm annual welfare and global health development, but also not necessarily just from like very near term perspective. But so for example, things, uh, charities that are working on improving policy are a little bit more speculative, also have long term effects, for example, if they do you know, put that in place. Um, when it comes to long termism, that depends on the specific idea or specific cost. So things that we are investigating this year for the uh, summer program in 2023, uh, we are looking into health security and biosecurity. So that's sometimes seen as like a long termist cost. And that's something that we are researching right now as well. Actually, Akhil here is our lead researcher. So if you want to chat about biosecurity ideas, uh, he'll be a great person to chat with. Um, so that's kind of like what, what we have planned for the near future in terms of long term causes. Uh, we, we are not planning to investigate other long termist causes at the moment. Cool. So I think that's it from the live discussion. Does anyone have any other burning questions? Um, cool. uh, actually, I just posed one final question in the last discussion. I was just trying to ask you what do you think of first gaining experience in the for profit entrepreneurship sector and then afterwards, like a non profit? I guess it really depends, as you said, on what your intentions are, what you're trying to achieve, but what's your take on that? Yeah, so I do think kind of generally entrepreneurship learns, uh, teaches you some skills that are going to be applicable in nonprofit entrepreneurship as well. Uh, it sometimes also teaches you a little bit bad habits that they will have to be unlearned later on. Uh, so that's a little bit of a con. And um, some of the people that started charity with us have uh, a background in for-profit entrepreneurship uh, in the past, and that has been helpful for them uh, to, in founding a nonprofit later on as well, just because some things are like management or you know accountability, things like that are transferable. Um, 
I don't necessarily uh, think that might be like the best thing for every person to do. Um, I think I would prefer for a person who has like really strong potential to like start with nonprofit entrepreneurship and you know, if they fail, they fail and that will teach them probably more transferable skills to then later on shut down this organization and start a new one instead of going for profit and then nonprofit. Um, but that might depend on your like personal trade fits, like, you know, what you're currently good at, uh, what you want to get better at. Uh, so I think that might slightly depend person to person. Um, but I also think like entrepreneurship generally is a good background to have when you're starting nonprofit um, charity as well. So I have a question. How do you choose between starting a for profit or some non profit charity? Does one tend to have a larger impact than the other? Yeah, so I haven't seen a very in depth analysis of the kind of average impact of for profit versus non profit. I think with for profit, it really depends uh, like what's your theory of change. So, like, is it that you're trying to start a for profit company to then like um, learn? Uh, uh, earn a lot and then be able to donate that to like top ch top charities working in nonprofit sector. So that might be like part of that. Or are you trying to do that uh, because, for example, your for profit is serving like an emergence um, an emerging market, for example, as Wave is a for profit company that is basically enabling uh, transfers from uh, people who emigrated from lower income country to higher income country and are sending back money to to their relatives still in the country. That's kind of, for example, uh, an example of for profit or like a social enterprise um, that is still kind of impact directly impact focus. Um, I think there's just like not uh, enough right now, like high impact um, for profit started by EAs to really see the outcomes of that very well. Um, but my sense would be given that, for example, funding is not, if you're pursuing kind of, if your theory changes that, you start a for profit to then uh, get funding and then donate it to charities, that it might be a less impactful than directly starting a nonprofit, just because funding availability is rarely um, a kind of the limiting factor for uh, impactful nonprofits. Um, so if that's your fear of change, probably nonprofit is better. If you have some really great for-profit idea that you think that is directly contributing to to, to that every impact, uh, then that's something that you can evaluate like case by case. Sweet. So I think that's it for questions. Um, oh, sorry. One more at the end. Yeah. Thanks. Um, thank you for the talk. Uh, quick question in terms of, of course, a really important part for early stage startups is the mentorship incubation period. How does your organization set up that mentorship? Is it procured based on the specific nonprofit? Is it from within the organization? So basically, how do you set up the mentorship? Sure. Yeah. So we both have like internal mentorship program and we also engage external mentors as well. So basically anyone who get incubated at the end of the incubation program, get a mentor from CE assigned to them. Uh, it's often, you know, me, Joey or Patrick, so our senior team at, at CE. And we divide that, uh, for example, regard um, based on like cost areas. So I might be mentoring the farm annual wealth for charities because of my background. Uh, Patrick might be mentoring maybe the global health and development charities and Joey will be mentoring EA Meta charities, for example. Um, so we kind of both have, plus we have kind of specialists, for example, research analysts who research that given charity idea, helping out the charity as well with kind of more of the kind of technical information or information about the intervention itself or helping them with monitoring and evaluation. So that's kind of like uh, internal mentorship. And we provide basically for the first six months, we meet with people once a week. Um, so every week we have a chat with them, talk about, you know, what is the most challenging for you this week? What is the most exciting? How can we you know, make it better? Answering some quick questions and helping them. Uh, at the beginning in more intense matter. And then we go down a little bit. Maybe instead of meeting once a week, we meet with them once a month. And then slowly over time, kind of that mentorship uh, goes over time. You know, eventually our charities are so much more informed and so much better at what they do than we are. And it, it often kind of reverse after, you know, so for example, with Fish Welfare Initiative, now when I have mentorship call, calls with Tom and Haven, uh, 50, um, you know, 80% of that is like, me learning from them instead of them learning from me. So after some time in reverse, which is really great as well. But on top of that, uh, we also have kind of external mentors um, that are within our extensive network. We have you know a couple of dozens of them and we match them with the right charity as well. Sometimes to answer, for example, specific questions. Oh, I'm registering in this weird country and I have no idea how to run operations. We have someone, for example, who you experience operations in that country and we'll able to connect them or kind of more long term uh, mentors for them as well. And so just specific questions. So kind of both both that. And but that's done done on more ad hoc basis whenever that's needed. Great. All right. Please join me in saying one last thank you to Caroline.